Again, I'd like to thank all of the organizers. I probably, I know we're way behind time. I'm going to try to do this very quickly as well, too. Okay, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, the organizers, I'm really grateful for this. As soon as I saw the title, Conscious Tech, I knew I had to be here in uh, Hala. We had a lot of conversations about this as well, too. And I'm really inspired by this movement and, and the people that I've met so far, mainly because I'm kind of on a mission as well, too, of re-examining what entrepreneurship and what organizational culture is all about and really looking at it from the perspective of personal development and really kind of re-humanizing it and trying to bring, bring kind of, you know, dare I say it, the love <laughs> back to, you know, what we collectively are all doing. And so my talk today is on conscious tech and our collective future. To, state the, to start the issue and to explore the problem, though, I'd also like to ask you guys to uh, answer a question. I challenge you to name one technology developed in Asia, including the Middle East, I suppose, uh, over the last 300 years that has made a global impact. Wait, so if you think about the last 300 years, there's been the Industrial Revolution, right? Automobile, airplanes, media, electricity, all of these innovations developed that have made a global impact. Now, name one in the, over the last 300 years that was invented in Asia or the Middle East. Anyone? Ali? Alibaba, the online site? Huh? Well, Silk, arguably, there, there are things 5,000 years ago, there's been tons. Right, the number zero, uh, I'll go through a bunch. But over the last 300 years, name one. So Alibaba, in terms of online, if you look at auctions, online auctions, there have been a lot before that, eBay, et cetera. But name one invention that was developed, invented in Asia over the last 300 years. Hmm? Well, okay, so bamboo, there's been tons. Again, 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, there's been tons. Now, the thing is that if you look at Asia, and this is if you add the Middle East to this as well, too, <clears throat> if you look at Asia, that's like half the world's population, and it's the highest GDP today. And so the thing is, it hasn't always been like this. If you look 5,000 years ago, there's been a lot. So silk, you know, porcelain, money, compass, the number zero invented in India. And so the question is, 5,000 years ago, we were very innovative. And if you look at uh, Arab culture, and if you look at what happened in the fusion of the Christian and the Arab cultures in Spain, and the innovation and the Renaissance that came from that, lots of inventions hundreds of years ago. But what happened over the last 300 years? And why are we no longer able to innovate? Well, yes. <laughs> The answer is yes, and the answer is colonization, <laughs> yes. Initially, physically, but then today, psychologically, right? So everyone already is talking Louis Vuitton and all this. If you look at the shops here and everything, and part of the inspiration, I think a, a couple of the conversations I've had here today so far too is the beauty of Egypt, the beauty of the local culture here. Why isn't this expressed in the international on, on the world, right? Why are we continue to be subjugated psychologically? And so this is kind of what we're looking at. And so part of the issue around this is the framing of reality. The Eastern framing of reality, the Western framing of reality is this is me, this is all not me, I'm going to go explore, conquer, discover, and then God or someone, God or someone will judge me later on. Yeah? So that's the Western framing of reality. The Eastern framing of reality is this is me, but I'm part of this. And I can't explain who I am without explaining what this is. 
And so the West, it's a hero's journey where I'm going off into the material world and I'm conquering and I'm discovering and everything. The Eastern journey, it's an inner journey. So if you look at the heroes of the East, you know, two of which you mentioned in terms of Gandhi and uh, the initial bird <laughs> metaphor, is it's an inner journey. Right? And so the framing of reality is very, very different. Now, are you guys familiar with what's known as the left-hand path and the right-hand path? No? So the right-hand path is in, if you look at culture and if you look at organizations, there is a whole hierarchy, there's a whole system that's been developed. Me, is Dakai still here? Yeah, Dakai's here. We both went to school. We're both academics, so you have to publish papers and everything. And you follow the rules, and you climb the ladder, and you will succeed. And there are mythologies around this, and you just, as long as you, you know, follow the rules and comply and, and hit your numbers and targets and everything, you will succeed. That's the right-hand path. Apologize for the language. The left-hand path are people that see how things are, see the systems that have been in place that have been handed down generation to generation, and they say, fuck all this shit. I'm going to do my own thing. And so that's the left-hand path where they follow their bliss, right? So they're finding their truth, not in here, but within here, and they're going to make their way through. And that's the way of the true entrepreneur, the true artist, the true scientist. You have to go beyond the confines of what society has told you is right, and you have to, it's the Prometheus story. You have to go out into the unknown, into the wilderness, discover the fire, and then bring it back. And so this is an ancient journey, it's an ancient quest that you, as entrepreneurs, are embarking upon. Now, the reason why this is important today is because if you look at society today, especially if you're married and you have kids, if you look at where the world is going today, especially here in the Middle East, we're fucked. Right? 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 Not only for us, you know, Masa, I'll have a pretty good life, you know, I'm, I, you know, a couple more years, you know, I'm traveling around, retiring and everything, but, you know, what's it like for my kids? What's it like for their kids? Right? I remember my wife took me to eat uh, this whole, this uh, tuna belly toro, you know, wild tuna belly toro. It's amazing. It melts in your mouth and everything. Can't buy it anymore. <laughs> They don't, it's all fished out, all gone, right? There's this plastic in the ocean, there's this pollution in China all around. If you look at the economic situation, you know, it's complicated, right? There's oil, we need energy, and there's money, and there's all this stuff. There's green tech, but oh, what about all this investment and all this oil? And, you know, what about all of this stuff and everything? If that goes to zero, we're kind of screwed, you know, say the bankers, et cetera, et cetera. Complicated, but, you know, short term looking at self interest creates long-term damage and havoc, right? And if you look at global warming and all these situations, we're kind of screwed. And so, <clears throat> kind of this is a bit of a segue. What's really required, and you know, it was really interesting talking to the organizers here, which um, have gone through quite ordeal, you know, I'd even just like to offer a moment of silence I heard uh, one, of the, one of the organizers, her mother died like three days ago or so, you know. A lot has been kind of sacrificed and just the time and the effort just to make this event happen. You know, it's really very, very meaningful, you know, to me. And for us to succeed, it's no longer kind of the East and the West. It's really what can we do together in collaboration. And so the Eastern approach, which a lot of the local people are doing right now too, 
is meditation. Now the West is just finding meditation and the inner journey. And I think what's important in collaborating and coming together is bringing together the best of both. And the exciting thing that we're looking at related to this is, is exploring and bringing in the values of all of these other cultures that haven't really been appreciated and bringing these into play and, 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 and actually not only thinking about them, but also exploring living them. Right? And so I was really grateful to hear that, uh, that a lot of the team here have been meditating and, and exploring mindfulness and these practices that have been getting them through a lot of the challenges that are faced. And so there are Eastern tools. And the premise is for innovation to go higher, the roots have to go deeper. Right? And it's very much an inner process that allows us to climb. Last year, I was in Bellagio at a, uh, there was a, a forum on exponential technologies and ethics. Now, with exponential technologies, what are we going to do? You know, where before, let's say if I went crazy, I could maybe kill two or three of you before you guys overpowered me and killed me. And now, with guns... You know, and I guess in Vegas he killed what sixty? How many? How many was that? <laughs> you know, and then now with biological weapons and all of these other things, nuclear, etc. You know, it's it's exponential, right? And what do you do? And I remember uh, the discussions were around Oppenheimer, who was fiddling with the science, was really excited. Hey, wow, we can make a nuclear bomb! Wow, look at this! This is so cool! And then they dropped it in Japan, and they're like, Oh, wait a minute! <laughs> what have I done? Right? And so there's a responsibility around this too. And the issue with ethics, how do we make rules? How do we create more rules so that this stuff doesn't happen? Well, creating rules is one way of doing it. The other is facilitating inner transformation. If I develop myself and I evolve myself, I naturally don't want to kill anybody. You know, I've never really had the urge well, it was that time at the airport. <laughs> I've never really had the urge to kill anybody, right? So as we develop and as we connect and collaborate, things that should be, well, you need rules for, you know, where do I put our taxes? <laughs> where do I register my company to save tax? You know, all of these things, if you're open and if you develop yourself and think more holistically, these things happen naturally. And so can we focus on the development of the individual? And then not only that, look at the development of the individual and look at entrepreneurship and all of the organizations that we're creating from the perspective of personal development. Now, it was interesting because our definitions of consciousness are very different. And a lot of different people have different definitions of consciousness. Right? The Middle East and... In Asia, the scientists understanding consciousness and the mass of consciousness. What do you mean by consciousness, right? And so it's very confusing. And so how do we come together to talk about something that is so important and so vital? My background is actually in electrical engineering and computer science. And I look at consciousness and I look at mind and body relationship as a relationship kind of like hardware and software in a computer. And so physically, we're all here. This is like the hardware. And this conversation is like the software. Just to mess with your minds a little bit, what I'd like to do is when I point at this, what's this? A water bottle? Yeah? So here I'm pointing at something in space and time, and you see it as a water bottle. If I mention, let's say, those three towers in, outside of Cairo that I think they're like graves for some, I don't know, there's some story, there are these three triangle things. <laughs> what are they called? Okay, so the pyramids. So here I'm pointing at something in space and time. When I mention those three triangle things outside of Cairo, I'm pointing at something here in this mental space. Yeah? 
And so the question is, physically we're here, but where are we here right now in this conversation or in this talk? Where is this space that we're in right now? <laughs> where is this? So physically we're here, you know, here's the water bottle, but when I talk about the pyramids in Giza, where is this? And what's the relationship between, well, here you're pointing there, but I'm here too. And so where is this? Right? And how does it relate? How do these things that are happening in the mind relate to what's happening in the body? Now, these things are important because all of your new ideas, every inspiration that you get, every insight that you get is going to come from here. <laughs> right? And so understanding its relationship is very important. Now, I come from the perspective, from a, Western, a more Western scientific perspective, that looks at mind and body, and I look at uh, uh, the assumption that consciousness is embodied. And so from the perspective of my awareness, and from the perspective of your awareness right now, all there is to everything in the universe right now, influencing the cells in your body, all there is to everything in the universe right now, is what you know from your senses, which is kind of the feeling in the, the room. There's how your body feels, whether you're hungry, thirsty, and have to go to the bathroom. And there's what you know from thought. And that's everything in the universe right now. As an example, does this water bottle exist? How do you know it exists? Okay, now, <laughs> does Donald Trump exist? <laughs> right? How do you know that Donald Trump exists right now? It's from thought. So the United States, you know, anything literally outside of your experience of the moment, you know from thought. Okay? Just bear with me for a second. And from the perspective of the cells in your body, that's how each of your cell is experiencing the world. It knows things from what's around it. There's how your body feels in terms of the internal processes, and there's what you know from thought. And those are the only things that are influencing the cells in your body. Yeah? Now, when you're born, there is no symbolic consciousness. There is no thought. When you're born, all there is is what's happening in your body and what's happening around you. Okay? And so what's happened, let me just jump through this a little bit. What's happened is, well, when we're born, we're born with instincts. And then as we go to school and everything, we develop the intellect. But where things get really interesting in terms of development and where society kind of fails us, where the Middle Eastern and the Eastern traditions are strong, are how do we move from intellect the conceptual understanding, to intuition and insight. To, in the Eastern perspective, we call it being. In the Western, pers or in the Middle Eastern perspective, we call it surrendering to the will of God. That which enables all of this. So the West is good at getting us from here to here, but very, very poor <laughs> at getting us from here to here. And that's the huge opportunity we have today. How do we move here? You know, we talk about wisdom in vague terms, etc. but what's actually happening? And so arguably when we're born, there is no symbolic consciousness. I'm just gonna run through five stages that we have of this process. So when you're born, there is no symbolic consciousness. Experiences bind symbols in thought to processes in physiology. So I have an experience. Initially, when I'm born, there is nothing. I just have sensations. Oh, that seems to happen. We call that wee-wee. That's a poo-poo, a breast, milk, mother, father. I start building a mental worldview 
And so initially things happen like this. I build a mental worldview. When I build my mental worldview, it's the symbols and thought that act through the physiology into the material world, the reality responds, which influences how I feel and how I think. And so the energy system of the body develops and the psyche develops. And the physiology wants to move to higher energy states. You know, why am I going skiing? Why am I driving fast cars? There's a big rally going on right now. Why am I kiteboarding and everything? Why am I jumping out of airplanes? It's because that experience kicks me into this peak performance flow state. And what I really crave isn't the activity, it's the flow state, which relates to how I'm breathing and how I'm holding my physiology. And so I develop, in the first part stage, is I buy into consensus reality. So school tells me what reality is, education system and, and, and society, the news tell me what reality is, kind of that's stage one, and I've developed capacity. Stage two, what happens where you guys are at is you look at the consensus reality and you say, hey, this isn't working anymore. There's got to be a better way. What was it, 1.3, 1.7 trillion dollars? I can't afford that. I don't think all of us can afford that. There's got to be a what? Who says this? Who's making these rules? What, this banker guy? Fuck him. <laughs> Let's do it a different way. Right? And so if you ever go to Burning Man, festivals like that, you have large groups of people who are saying, hey, there's got to be a better way. And so all of these things, what happens is they reject this, and what happens is they become coupled to one thing. Their whole vision becomes coupled to one thing. And so I'm just going to go all in on this. I reject concern. I'm going to go all in on one thing. So anyone tried to get a PhD, anyone that tried to get a male or female to marry them, <laughs> <laughs> anyone that's doing a startup, what happens is these different parts of you that are just energetically spread parts of you become coupled to this one thing, and then what happens is your whole endocrine system, your whole autonomic nervous system becomes coupled to your perception of this one thing. Let's say you're with the company, it gets funded and everything, you feel great, yeah, all right, hey, all right, we got our first client, yeah. Let's say, you know, the CFO steals all the money or you get accused of sexual harassment or something. Like, oh, shoot. You know? And so your whole emotional system and your whole energy system becomes coupled to your perception of this one thing. And that's this focus commitment. So first image is think of a yolk becoming a chick. The second is I just focus on one thing. And these workshops and the startup stuff that's happening here is really trying to get you to focus commitment to figure out what you really want to do, come together as a group, and collectively focus on one thing to try to make it happen. After that, and if I'm able to fully decouple, that's effectively being reborn. And all that's left, if I can decouple the influences of symbols, the only thing that's left is what's around me, <laughs> And there's how my body feels, which is what it was like when you were a baby. But you know that there are bigger forces at work. You know that God has a plan for you. And if you start listening and tuning into your inner compass, how best can I honor this moment? What am I willing to give my life to? And as I explore that and connect and refine my intuition as things show up. So before it was thoughts acting through physiology into the world and then back. If I decouple from this, it's back to this. <laughs> and then as things show up, you try them. And they either happen or they don't. And then as I attenuate that, refining intuition, and then if everything that I intend happens, that then becomes really interesting. And what we found here is that people that have gone through this process, a lot of them end up developing special abilities. Empaths, intuitives, medical healers, energy healers. Really interesting. It actually starts here when they pop up. And so right now, this is a fascinating area of research for us. Getting back to why this is important for entrepreneurs is that you are, as an entrepreneur, going through this process. Right? You don't know which way is up and down. How am I going to pay, you know, the salaries for the next month, etc.? You know, I need that mirror. You're always on that edge. Right? And if you're not grounded, 
if you're not grounded, it's very easy for you to spin into depression, get lost. Some people end up committing suicide. Right? If they become so attached and they don't know the difference. And so this is really challenging. And so the thing about this is we know, actually, there's a lot that we know about neuroscience and physiology, and we know the process of transformation. This is the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell. And so initially, it starts with a call to action. There's a refusal of the call. <laughs> the, there's an ancient mystagogue that usually gives you advice and everything. There's a threshold guardian you usually have to conquer, which is usually your investor. <laughs> you have to convince them. Once you get the money, you're in the realm of the unknown, the belly of the whale. There's apotheosis, which is the transformation process. There's the return journey, the return threshold guardian, where this was a symbolic death, this is a symbolic birth. This becomes a master, of, you become master of the two worlds. So it's a process of expanding your energy and then integration, expansion and integration. This is the process of personal development and transformation. And your entrepreneurship and everything that you do is just context for you toward to develop. And so if we can understand this, rather than looking at it literally, rather than looking at things literally, can I look at things more mythically? And so you'll know in different stories, movie, it's just the same movie, you know, played out in different ways. And these are all archetypal characters. And so can you look at things, can you know the process of transformation and the process that you're going through of going from the known to the unknown, discovering the fire and then bringing it back. And then along the way, the characters that you encounter, can you not only look at them literally, but then look at them mythically, right? And so we have R2D2 and C3PO here as our MCs, <laughs> right? <laughs> R2D2, C3PO. Yeah, <laughs> and so looking at them and looking at the archetypal elements that they're playing in the context of the journey, right? And so that way you're there, you're expecting, and you know this is a existential issue that you're facing, and there are people that are showing up that have their role to play. Now, the big stories, if you look at this, after people have succeeded, and this is for those of you that are on the venture funding side, is what you do after you've taken care of living, you know, eating, and you know, taking care of your family, I've made enough to retire and everything. There are four broad stories that drive you. And it depends on whether your inner world is primary or material world is primary, east or west, and whether you're self-centered or you're collective-centered. If I'm material world primary and self-centered, then what drives me is money, sex, power, trying to live forever. Yeah? If I'm material world primary and collective-centered, then it's philanthropy, kind of like the Bill Gates thing, or the Star Trek fantasy, Elon Musk. Right? And this is the technology singularity. Yeah. If I'm inner world primary and self-centered, the objective is to become a body of light. So if you go to India, there are these sadhus, they sit in caves, they kind of develop themselves. If I'm in a world primary and collective-centered, it's about collective awakening. How do you wake up the whole planet? How do we get everyone on the planet to understand the relationship between the stories that they have and how they feel, the fears, needs, and desires, let those go and reconnect to the innate joy of being and to live from that. And the premise, is that if we can do that on a global scale, world peace. Now the exciting thing related to conscious tech is, and this is where things get interesting, because if you look at 5,000 years ago, what media was about, it was about helping you understand who are you, why are you here, and what is this? From cave paintings in Lascombe, to the early shamans around the fire, to the function of Stonehenge, and so, and then art, that, you know, that became art. Uh, traditional media is just a way of bringing art to more people. Mass media is just industrialized art. And then our interactive media is the latest form of that. Whereas originally it was about this, who are you, why are you here, what is this? 
Today, it's more about distracting you <laughs> from the problems at hand <laughs> and getting you to buy the thing that you don't really need, <laughs> right? And so how do we use media and bring it back to its original role and function in society? Now, the exciting thing is 5,000 years ago, your understanding of reality was dictated by the religious tradition where you lived. And as we developed, about 2,500 years ago, there was a split. There was the material domain uh, that became science, and then there was the mental domain that became religion and culture. And those have been split for quite some time. You know, there are groups and there's a museum, I think, in the south of America, in Georgia or something, where it's the creationist museum. So they have people riding dinosaurs and everything. And so the values and the data here, very, very skewed, taking the Bible literally, etc. But the interesting thing is what's happened today is there's a reconvergence. With interactive media and virtual reality, I can create a situation, I can create an experience in VR that engages your mind, but then by seeing the conscious decisions that you make and how your physiology responds, I can understand your worldview. And not only that, I know what the signature, the brain signature of a meditative state is like, and I can move you towards equanimity and self-knowledge. And this is really exciting stuff, which I would also call conscious tech. And so my kind of end game is really looking at how do we use media, interactive media, biofeedback, and intersubjective experiences, including entrepreneurship, to facilitate personal transformation and induce awakening. How can we engineer enlightenment? And so um, for me to see groups like this, uh, like the team here that has organized this wonderful event, and hopefully the beginning of something that really spar sp sprouts and really working towards starting a global movement, I'm just really excited and really grateful and really happy um, to see other like-minded people that are working in this space that also see the world in a similar way. And I think together we can make a difference. And so some of the projects that we've got too is a one is we're really looking at reframing entrepreneurship and organizational culture from the perspective of personal development. Now that we know the process of development, how can we refine this and how can we support entrepreneurs and look at creating companies that are sustainable. So today, the performance of a company is inversely correlated to the well-being of the employees. How do we design it so that as the employees are doing their work, they're more connected to their intuition and their self-knowledge, and as they do that, as they become more intuitive, that contributes to the bottom line. And that's what's needed in organizations in innovation today. One of the things that we're doing is I go to the World Economic Forum every year, and um, next year we've rented some space and we're looking at creating a festival called Alt Davos that's gonna happen right after the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, uh, another thing that we've done too is right now what I'm talking to you and the presentation is conceptual. For those of you that have experiences, they're going, ha, yeah, I remember that. But the ad most advanced form of learning that we have isn't necessarily this kind of, you know, no offense, the, the hackathon and in talks. It's really about going and doing something together. And so we pioneered a new form of an event called an evolving caravan, where we actually tour the world, <laughs> running workshops and giving talks and looking at collective emergence together. <laughs> and so when you have a bunch of people that have done a lot of inner work, traveling together in the unknown, where we don't know where we're gonna stay, <laughs> we don't know what's gonna happen, magic happens. And so how do we move to more integrated forms of experiential learning? And so there's a workshop I run related to the first one called Entrepreneurship, Innovation, Self-Discovery. I just found out, I looked at my ticket again, I thought I was leaving Saturday, I'm actually leaving Sunday. <laughs> so I'm around all day Sunday. <laughs> If any of you are interested in talking more deeply about any of these matters, I'm around Sunday. <laughs> I'm in 5002 at the, uh, the <laughs> just show up, you know. Um, again, for me, you know, without sounding too sacrilege, I am on a mission from God, and anything that I can do with my time here to help facilitate, more than happy to. 
The other key thing I'm doing too is I'm creating, using the blockchain, I'm creating a global decentralized mystery school. And so the challenge here is in terms of these stages that I talked about, usually what happens here, people in society today that are going through this, a lot of them end up in mental hospitals. A lot of them end up depressed and everything. And so we have people with special abilities and we're creating a online global, and actually physical, global decentralized mystery school using the blockchain to mainly help these stage three to stage five people. Think of it as an Hogwarts, a digital Hogwarts. And so those are some of the projects that we have working. And I'm just really glad to be here. And again, thank you.